Before the next episode of XJob Downloaded starts, I have a big favour to ask. If you've enjoyed any of our episodes so far, please can you click on the follow button on your platform. I'm on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon and YouTube. It costs nothing to follow, but makes a real difference to me as a podcast producer. Thank you. This interview is being tape recorded. My name is Paul Maleri and this is X Job Downloaded. And today I'm going to interview Andy Doc Halliday. Now, <laughs> you may well laugh. It's um it's interesting. Andy was a, a Metropolitan Police Officer and then went on to manage the Great Britain hockey team. Uh hockey was you know something that was close to our heart as a family, and it's really great that I can talk to you today. So, Andy, without further ado, where did it all begin? <laughs> so, uh, oddly, my... I mean, I knew I was not brilliant at school. Um, and, and, you know, life in the in the 70s schooling was actually about academia. Sport really didn't come into it. So, you know, in those days, you couldn't get qualifications for sport. And um, Where did you go to school, though? It's an old, well, what was St Norman's Grammar School, but right. was, was became Verulam School, and uh, it it was um, I I just didn't really perform. Um, I ended up with I think it was three O levels, um, but loved my sport, and um, I left in what was then known as the lower sixth, and would you believe I, I became a milkman, Did um, you? and and ended up driving one of those electric milk floats. Illegally, I might might add. Oh, you think about my later <laughs> career. Um, so I heard an advert on Capital Radio sitting in my milk float, and uh, it said, "Do you want to earn twenty two pound a week? Uh, play as much sport as you like. Join the Metropolitan Police Cadets." Uh, and I, I thought that sounds fantastic, but I, I I did sort of think that in a year's time I'd probably end up stepping away from that because I thought the sport will probably stop. Um, but I didn't. I, I ended up staying for 31 years. And I know that um, John Sutherland, in his his books that, that he's written about, about the job and his experiences, he talks about a painful privilege. And I have to agree with him. I think when I when I look back and that over that career th- spanning 31 years, it was an absolute privilege. But there was there were a lot of moments that were very, very painful throughout. Yeah. So what what year did you join as a cadet? Uh, 79. So that was the year of Edmund Davis. So the cops were just starting to get a proper pay rise. Introduced by the Labour Party or brought about by the Labour Party, then Maggie introduced it as soon as she arrived because she loved the police and law, law and order. Where did you – you went to Hendon, I assume, to do your cadet training. Where did you get based after you came out of Hendon? So it was a massive eye-opener. from The whole cadets um, – it was only a year, but what an eye-opener for me. So – during that sort of cadetship, uh, I, I worked at King's College Hospital down in Camberwell, South London. Very, very busy A and E, um, all sorts going on, uh, and out learning what happens with, you know, out with senior police officers in in uh, in Clapham and and what was then the old known as L Division, L District, uh, in Brixton. So this was 1980, and of course a year later. Yeah. We had the Brixton riots. So to say that there was tension in the area around that time, I mean, as I say, I'm look, home counties lad, loves a bit of hockey, middle class upbringing, couldn't really want for more, supportive family. And then I'm suddenly thrown into this, um, you know, the the, the, the chaos of, of South London. Um, what an eye opener. And I thought, yeah, I want more of this. So then I uh, went to training school um, and I ended up being posted out to what was then Y, y District, Y Division. So it was, it was Enfield, Haringey, Tottenham yep. at the behest of one of the local chief superintendents who who was a hockey. I think he was chairman of the Met Police Hockey right, okay. uh, Association at that time. So he, he sort of said, right, I want I want this guy on my division. Um and I, it, those were in the days that you'll probably remember where, where actually job sport was valued. Yeah. Um, but, but what it meant was that I was 
I was told you will play for the Met Police on Saturdays. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that's why I've got you onto this division. So that 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 was how it all started. But um, yeah, so if you like, really as a 19 year old then coming out of the cadets and patrolling on your own <clears throat> and just being um, exposed to life that probably a year, 18 months earlier, I couldn't even imagine. No, of course not. You know, yeah. It, it, it's, it, but it, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because they actually, it's the development as an individual. I, I wasn't a cadet. I've got lots of friends who were, but it's your development as an individual. Um, it takes you forward into your into your later career. And where were you playing your hockey before you joined the police at St Albans? St Albans, yeah. Always, um, always a one club man through and through. Uh, played. I, I actually only ended up playing about half a season for the Met because it. It was a, it was a it was a challenging one of those really challenging dilemmas at that point. So, if I was going to play international hockey, I, I had to really play at a, a sort of top, a top yeah, level of club, yeah, of which course, the Normans yeah. were. Uh, if I played for the Met Police, my time off was effectively sorted, and I, it actually ended up coming to a, a little bit of a sort of happy medium in between the two. Um, so I was playing a little bit for the Met Police in the what was then known as the PAA Cup, yeah, um, and playing my league hockey with St Albans. So and those PAA games were absolutely fantastic. You know, it, we got to travel with them, didn't we? You'd go off to Northern Ireland, you'd go all over all over the country to play your police hockey. It was brilliant, and that's where we made a lot of friendships and i think that you're quite right the, the the police sport the way that it has gone downhill deteriorated it's it's a real shame because well look at us today you know i, I i've reached out because we played hockey previously together yeah. against each other you know i always remember playing against st albans when i played at clacton and you had two brothers that played at st albans if i remember rightly they were fairly fairly tidy, but um, but yeah, it's about that camaraderie and it's about the the, the network that you build within sport, and it, it makes a hell of a difference. Absolutely, I I look because you you're reminding me now of um, some of the trips I went on a couple of trips out to the the RUC as they were then known, and the Met were big rivals yeah. in hockey, um, and. They, it was interesting because it would be, these were the times of the troubles where, where you know, when they came over to the UK, it was, oh, we can let our hair down now for four or five days. We <laughs> don't have to did. worry about checking under our cars, and 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 they did. Um, in in sort of the contrasting way, when we went over there to play a competition, obviously during those times, we had twenty four seven security with us. Yeah, um, I remember they took us out to a a little fishing village called Donegadee, which was right out on the coast. Um, and basically the night before the game, which was you know, the, the big police cup semi-final, the night before the game, there were three or four of their sort of local officers came in to befriend us. And the, uh, the, the, the beer, but particularly uh, the, the Irish whiskey, flowed and they absolutely plied us with <laughs> knowing full well that, that it would give them the best chance of winning the game the Next following day. morning. And I do remember in the back of a transit van traveling to Newfords, which was their uh, their ground the following morning, and some of our players having to sort of lean out the back of this van um because they were feeling so ill, and and the driver saying, "Look, guys, we can't stop here. This is not the place to stop." No. Um, and and I, you know, I even remember they beat us two one, uh, but it was the most sociable, brilliant event. I'm still in contact with quite a few of those guys who who they were good hockey players, but they were brilliant people as oh, well. Yeah, they were. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, their the sociability was second to none. I mean, they they and they came over here for R and R, and they still played a good game of hockey even after a, a few pints at Guinness and Jamesons. So when you when you're in the police, you're based at Tottenham between eighty and eighty five. Yeah, first uh, first few years learning the ropes, uh, very much the, the the new kid on the block. I was the one that made the tea. I was the one that always sort of sat in the back of the car. You know, those first few years as as, as you learn, and you are posted with a couple of parent constables. When, you know, when you think about the culture in those days, obviously things are very very different now. Mm. Um, 
but, but you learn a great deal from the experience around you. And I think, you know, when I reflect on that time, and it, it really touches on your point earlier around there are almost these, they're, they're, they're not tangible skills that you learn, the ability to communicate with others, the ability to work within a team, um, make very, very quick decisions on situations that you, frankly, you knock on a door, you don't know what's going to happen behind the door. You make, you know, those sorts of, that, that sort of training, I think, it's unscripted. Uh, as I say, it's not it's not tangible. It's just one of those areas where for that first three or four years, I learned so much, both as a police officer, but also as a, as a human being. Yeah, absolutely. Were you there during the when the riots took place? when Keith Blakelock lost his life. Yes, I was. Um, in fact, I was I was actually living at the, the section house at Tottenham at, at that time. And I was I was then uh, I was known as the I was the district riot training instructor. So I used to do six weeks of teaching riot training down at we had a I say purpose built. It was an old warehouse, which is now just a couple of hundred yards from the O2. Right. Um, so it was a bit of old old waste ground there. We did our riot training for that part of London. So I used to teach six weeks down there and six weeks working uh, on the streets of Tottenham. And again, you know, they were they were real tough times. I mm. think um, I remember the animosity that 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 came from certain parts of the community. And I'm you know I'm not saying that everything that we did was squeaky clean. I think the culture probably around those times was very very different and you felt that there was this, it was like a powder cake, you know, at some point uh, it was, there would have to be this, this let off of pressure. Yeah. Um, so, and it was tough and living in that, that area as well of Tottenham, I used to live in a section house, literally 200 yards from White Hart Lane uh, from Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, so you couldn't escape, you know, if you went, there were a couple of local pubs, uh, that we used to use, where where we, which were sort of known, uh, we were known, but you couldn't really escape from a situation that was. You always had to just watch your back walking down the high road. I, rem- I remember that on or off duty. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, it, and it was of course it was a very sad time for for policing in general when um, Keith Blake lost his life. And I've, I remember going to the the crime museum at uh, the old Scotland Yard that. Um, and because they have his tunic, and you know the the you can see the, where the weapons were used, etc. And it's it's quite heartbreaking. I think I think I think on that and on that, Paul. The the, the I, what I think really brought it home, because I remember the barbarity of that attack. Yeah, and I think it was knowing first of all relating to the uniform, but but you know I knew Keith not particularly well, but but I knew him as a as a Geordie lad who was he was just a good guy yeah um, and and that 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 whole you know you, you hear of police officers you know passing but it was the barbarity of that event yeah that I really I think really shook everyone up yeah ab- absolutely right and it's still you know a day that every police officer remembers even if you weren't serving at that time it's something that it resonates through the the whole of the police community when did you um, get involved in firearms? When did your love of firearms start? So it was a natural drift, really, in that I was riot training instructor first, uh, had a big following still in my sport. The folk that were riot training instructors generally were sporty folk. Yeah. So it moved across there. But then there was almost a, a natural, a lot of people from that, the right training department also drifted across into the firearms unit because I think there was a both a sort of physical and cognitive fitness I think was important for in both roles um, particularly you know the support being around like-minded folk who like sport who were fit who uh, that that was one of the drivers I think for me so I, I, I ended up riot training instructor up to about 92 then a couple of colleagues 
went across to what was then uh, I'm trying to think what it what did from a department perspective what it was called PT 17 I think at that time we were PT 18 um, and they 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 started for the first time at the armed response vehicles right so on the, on the back of um, the 1987 Hungerford uh, Michael Ryan who who I think killed. I think it was about 17 people in in Hungerford. They set up armed response vehicles, so they needed a first response. I think there was still a a strong feeling that that, that the Dixon and Dot Green. We don't want to arm the British Bobby, but we need a response. Yeah. So uh, they, the Met were the, the first to set these up, and I was on the second armed response vehicle course in. Uh, I think it was late 92, might have been early 1993. Um, so, so I moved from riot training, purpose-built centre, Hounslow, all our riot training over there for the Met, across to, we were based at Old Street at the time, whether it was the Force Firearms Unit, of which there were probably, I think, around that time, there were 50 or 60 armed response vehicle officers supporting specialist firearms teams. So, yeah, nine, 93, I guess, uh, 92, 93. And did you go straight into instructing or were you on the ARVs? I did uh, probably two or three years as a an armed response vehicle officer, then did the specialist firearms course. So ended up in 95, almost at the, at the top of your, if you like, sort of the Olympic level in, in a sport comparison of, yeah. of firearms policing. So worked with uh, specialist firearms teams, some incredible really very professional folk uh, from 1995 onwards. And then I'm trying to think what, what year I did my instructor's course, but it was fairly soon after that. Uh, so became an instructor and did a, generally it was a year, 18 months operationally and then in a training role. I, I always remember going on a job, we were going to arrest some murderers in Hackney and um we needed the, the Met to do the MOE. And they had every bit of kit. I mean, they literally blew the doors off of this address to arrest these suspects. And it was, you know, arm, land row, armoured land row. Every, everything was just there to get these suspects out. It was absolutely fascinating. And we were watching it on a microwave link from another address. Absolutely brilliant. So did you work with Tony Long and, and, um, and the like? Yep. Yeah, I was on. Uh, I wasn't on the same team as uh, as TL, but he worked on at the same time. Uh, he worked. I think I was on black team. He was on green team uh, around that time. And we did we instruct together. I can't. I can't remember. But uh, yeah, those were through through that period. I was working alongside TL. Yeah, well, uh, I, I know a few. So Tony Kelly, uh, Mick Gammons. And then we had a chief inspector who said that he he worked with you, ended up getting convicted up in Merseyside for fraud. Um, <laughs> I b believe it or not, he, with me personally, or, no. or well, he he was he was said he, he said he was a firearms instructor, and he transferred from Essex to Merseyside, and then forged his application form to go to chief superintendent, and uh, yeah, he subsequently got convicted and locked up. But yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> it was an interesting time, and I know, I know Tony Kelly and um, a few of the other guys, as I say, from the from the weapons training. And that was based at Gravesend, wasn't it? At that time, was weapons training. So initially, it was at uh, Lippitz Hill. So oh, we, okay. we were right on the borders with Essex, where the helicopters uh, are now. Um, so where the uh, where the Lippitz Hill helicopter base used to be right. was also it was an old um, POW camp from the Second World oh, was War it? with Nissan huts. And ghosts and uh, uh, four ranges, fairly industrial in its uh, in its appearance, uh, and but it worked. Uh, it worked for us, and I think. But then the department was growing. You know, we the the whole firearms firearms crime in the in the Met and the way things were growing and the threat was changing, and it just we just outgrew it. So they they then took over what was the old merchant. Navy training centre down at Milton Gravesend, right on the Thames there. And uh, I mean, it's a much it was purpose built centre, public order, firearms. So everything went down there. Um, about two or oh, I mean, 2000 and 
2003, I think it all moved, 2002, around that time. So did you see your time out there did, as, a, as an instructor? Did you do your, your, the rest of your service there? Um, I did the rest of my service on a uh, – it, it, it was mainly operationally. Yeah. So I did uh, 18 years in total of which – so what they – what they tried to do is that they understood the stresses and pressures that were on specialist firearms teams. So, as you know, you 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 know you don't have a scripted week. No. You generally know what you might be doing, but then you'll pitch up and you might go home 18, 20 hours later. Uh, you then might have to be back in in six or seven hours. So, and I think understanding the toll that that takes on on the human body. Uh, so they would try and ensure that you you got a break from operational work. So becoming an instructor was ideal because you would then you do nine months, a year of instructional work and then go back out operationally, which was a way of sort of preserving both your physicality, you know, your your ability to to pitch up um, and and be fit both both mentally and physically for what you were doing so i think uh, i think it was a, it was a good system certainly that there was there were those who because there was more overtime on operations there were those that probably wanted to just do operations all the time but there is this thing called allostatic load i don't know if you've heard of that phrase right. which is it's unconscious stress right. um and and certainly over the last 10 or 15 years i think i've i've learned much more about this where where actually you know subconsciously if you imagine your body being like a car engine uh, and if you constantly accelerate, brake, accelerate, brake, accelerate, brake all the time, then what does that do to your engine? You can, you know, you can sort of think about it. So, so actually in a, in a, in a car sense, if you allow the car to slow down rather than putting your foot on the brake all the time and just take your foot off the accelerator gently. So those, it, it's a nice little analogy, but I think, it's actually really important that that we, because of our commitment to the job, and you know, hearing what, what you were talking about, bashing on doors at two o'clock in the morning, all these sorts of brilliant things that that, that you do, you've actually got to look after yourself. Um, so, so I think that you know, that handling that allostatic load, as, as as they call it, that unconscious stress, is probably, if I reflect on it now, probably didn't do enough of it, but. Uh, ultimately, you know, we, we live longer as a result. That's the that's what it will come down to. Absolutely. And whilst you're balancing your work, you're still playing hockey, of course. Yes, and that and that in a way was so. Yeah, the interesting thing about this was that uh, it got to a point as a specialist firearms officer, you you are very much committed to what you're doing. So I had to really knock representative hockey on the head. Um, and that wasn't necessarily that I didn't want to play it. It it was more around, you know, if you're on call for a week mm. uh, and you are, well, then we were relying on pagers. You'd carry a pager with you in those days. You know, if that pager went off, you'd, you'd have to go in. Uh, so I, there were a few times, I think, where I cried off from, from hockey matches quite late on, representative games, saying, no, sorry, can't do it. Uh, so I actually, I just, I shelved it. I, I, I stopped uh, playing hockey and um, and just really threw myself into working as a specialist firearms officer. I mean, it's interesting, and you were playing at a really high standard as well at, at that time. Um, were you doing the Great Britain stuff then? Were you involved with the Great Britain setup then? I played international hockey. I was part of the um, the training squad for the 1988 Olympics. So the, so the bigger training squad that we had around that time. Sean Curley. Uh, Sean Curley, oh, those yeah. the entail days yeah. where we won gold. Yeah. Um, I was part of the, the, the big sort of squad of 26, 28, but wasn't good enough to go in the 16. My, my issue, Paul, was that I always, I, ha I have the turning circle of an all sea ferry. I, I, was, I would get turned inside out by the top international players and some of the top domestic players. And that was a bit of a barrier for me around yeah. actually getting to the very top. Um, so that's probably why I never went to Olympic Games. But around my, my I, I suppose I won the, I was fortunate enough to win the UK Player of the Year in 1991. And 
at that point, so I was nearly 30, I, I, I then, it was just before I transferred into the firearms unit, and then gradually I, I just played less and less um, over the, the sort of following years. But then oddly, uh, some 12 years later, the events around 7-7 for, for, for me and that period, and you know, it's, uh, my name is in the public domain linked to the, the incident with Jean Charles de Menezes in the in the tube. But you know, I, I being on that team, right? Um, I think that had quite a big big impact on 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 me. And I, I I sat back, I think, at the end of that, and thought that I I I needed my hockey again. Yeah. Um, so actually, so actually, through that period around two thousand and late 2005, early 2006, I contacted the then performance director and said, give me a job. <laughs> no, well, it wasn't that blunt, but but I'd like to get, you know, use my experiences, get back involved in hockey in some way. And that's when I, I started getting back involved with England, Great Britain, first of all, with the, the under 21 group. Um, and then and then a couple of years later with the seniors. So that, when you were you on that fateful day then that, at Stockwell? Yes, I was, and I, you know, I talk quite openly ab- ab- about it now, um, for a number of reasons. I think, firstly, that it, it taught me a great deal about about not only myself, but but teams and organisations and the way that we work, our response, uh, and some of the work that I do now. I, I use it as, a, as as an example of. Uh, I mean, obviously, it was a terrible, terrible tragedy. Mm. Um, but you've got to it. You've got to learn from these things. I, I, I think you need you need what they call a justiceful approach to these sorts of events. In that, it, it, you have to approach them in a restorative way. You can't just seek to blame and move on because it doesn't achieve anything. I no. think you've you've got to seek to learn. What can we learn from this to make sure it doesn't happen again? Yeah, it was a, a, a terrible, terrible tragedy, and it was a you know a perfect storm of events on yeah, the day. Absolutely. Which, it just, um, I think part and part of the issue I think that, that comes from these sorts of events, and we're you know I think we're seeing this at the moment a lot with policing, is that there has to be a scapegoat. We have to blame, whereas actually you know what what is that going to achieve really? Yeah, so absolutely. the restorative approach and the justiceful approach, and 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 the restorative approach. I mean, don't get me wrong, justiceful. If there needs to be consequence after an event, then there needs to be consequence. But, but the big thing I think from that was was how do we make sure that that doesn't happen again? What can we do? And I think you look at you know there's human factors that there is so much that came into that day that yeah you know, I, I, we could sit here probably for hours oh. discussing the, the the events and what we can learn from them. But I, I ultimately. Those sorts of events have have a massive impact on on human beings. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Whether you are, it doesn't matter whether whether you're a witness, whether you're part of the investigation, uh, whether you were simply around that time travelling on the transport system. Because I don't know if you remember that palpable fear that we had around that 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 period. I do. So yeah, I I was I was part of the team um, entering entering the, the the tube station that day. Um, I think I I did an article for the Sunday Times around the London Olympics, uh, and in hindsight, was that because the, that event came up, and as a result, meant that my my name was in the in the public domain around right. it. But I, I've always been very very open around my role. Um, my, my recollection of events, um, and and more most importantly, the restorative nature of of you know, how approach and how how important that is. And it finished um, it finished some really good people's careers as well, didn't it? That whole incident because it was the the blame culture and the 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 finger pointing saw a number of really decent officers off, and it stopped them from continuing their careers and unnecessarily if I'm honest with you and I know a couple of them and I feel you know I I get it because like you say it, it, people want to hold people to account and all that but actually it was a, a catalogue of events that took place over that period of time I remember getting on the tube um, 
on the there was sort of a false alarm and there were some people chased into East London flats and and what have you. It could have gone the other way. And I just remember that the whole system come to a grinding halt again. And we had to walk from the Coliseum in Covent Garden to Liverpool Street because we couldn't get a cab. And we'd been to we'd been to an event there with the Australian High Commission. And it was just it was life changing for the whole of London. And I and I still think to this day, all these years on, we've there's still a hangover from it. People were still if you were of a certain age, you still remember that and you still look at some people with suspicion. You can't help it. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting how the whole, the whole mo, you know, the modus operandi of of, of terrorists has moved on and 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 seems to change as 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 we go. You know, now it's vehicles, it's knives, it's. Um, but when I when I think back to that whole that whole period um, of my life, it. I don't think quite realised at the time, but it it did have a major impact on my domestic situation. Yeah. Um, you know, my first marriage ended not long after th- those events. Now, I'm I'm not saying that it, it it was as a result, but it but it it probably would have happened anyway. But it was probably accelerated. I think the other thing that it, it came to sort of particularly bite me in the backside was that. Because Jean Charles de Menezes was Brazilian, um, yes, I'm, I made probably the error of of being very open with the Sunday Times about that that incident. But actually, it came back that I would, could not go with Great Britain men's hockey team to the Olympic Games in Rio because of that event. Wow! And the impact of that. So there were. You know, we 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 find that it was a fine tooth comb looking through everything ahead of that event. Mm. But there was a decision made around around security, around the fact that they believed that the Brazilian media already had a story that 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 was likely to surface through the games around me and my involvement. And you can imagine how the media could have got hold of something like that and the damage, uh, that sort of collateral damage that that. Could have come for Team GB, for the hockey team, for so you know the decision was made that I I shouldn't go, and you know that was a major blow not just to me but but to the you know, I remember when I told the team, and it was some months before, and I said look you know as a result of this incident, um, and they, they 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 knew what 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 had happened, um, the decision has been made that I'm not going to the Olympic Games with you, so yeah it's a bit like. You know, Gareth Southgate not going to a World Cup. That's yeah. probably it's not quite that that sort of level. But um, but you know a member of a trusted member of the staff team not going to an Olympic Games, and I was actually quite and I well, I, th- I get quite emotional when I think about it now. I was quite knocked flat around the the reaction of some of the athletes yeah. um, and how how emotional they were about you know how can they you know you were only doing your job how can they. You know, you're, you're such a you're a valued member of our team. How can we how can we go to the Olympics without you? It's not right. It's not fair. Um, you know, so quite yeah, quite a quite a reaction. And and so it was a there was a I say a hangover for at least eleven years. Yeah. Uh, from that event, but it as I as I said, Paul, I I probably didn't make the best decisions around uh, certainly the article with the Sunday Times. Um, but but look, yeah, I've learned so much from it. it yeah, it is what it is, and we're 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 down the line. And you've you know you've had a great great time with the the Britain ho- hockey team, Great Britain hockey team. What year did you actually retire, exit from the police? Uh, Twenty ten. Oh, okay. Um, so I was again fortunate, uh, having started working again with with England and, and and Great Britain hockey, both in a. So I was a national indoor coach from 2008, uh, managing the under-21 team for a couple of years from 2006. Then I took over as team manager of the senior group ahead of the World Cup in India in 2010. Uh, and interestingly, that was there was a, a, a threat to that event from, um, I think it was a group called the 313 Brigade, who were a Kashmiri 
uh, right. group who had threatened and then specifically threatened the English hockey team going to this oh, really? event. So, so I, it, oddly, I found this transition transition from the sport that I loved and been passionate about and represented England internationally. And then suddenly my influence around some of the work I'd done in the job and it, they were all coming together um, and, and, you know, talking to the team ahead of the event and trying to explain to them the difference between a credible threat and a non-credible threat and, you know, don't believe all you read on the internet, all these <laughs> sorts of... Uh, and, and so actually it became... And we ended up taking uh, four plain clothes officers with us to to, to India for, for that competition because of the level of... of um, I say the level of threats, probably... It wasn't necessarily a credible threat, but there were some concerns around that time because it was the year of the Commonwealth Games in Delhi. And I think there were some folk who wanted to, and this event was earlier in the year, the World Cup was in February, Commonwealth Games was in October. Um, so there were there were definitely groups, I think, who wanted to have an impact on the on the credibility of the Commonwealth Games, let's say. Yeah. So, uh, so we went, we had a holding camp in Doha, February 2010, before we went to the World Cup. We went and oddly, and it's funny how this affects athletes. We beat Australia in the first game. We were really up against the pump. Beat Australia. And then, of course, everybody forgets about any sort of security issues because yeah. we just beaten the Aussies. <laughs> so, and that was the year. So my plan that year, 2010, was, was always August, 30 years pensionable, step away. I'd, I'd got... Um, probably two or three months worth of annual leave as we all seem to do when we get to our careers yeah uh left left to take so I, I stepped away uh i think it was mid to late august um and, and of course all the special leave that i'd had across my years in the job playing hockey for the british police and which which they told me all the way through i had to add on to the end of my service and then, of course, when I go, I don't know if I should be telling you this on a, on a podcast, but I go up to admin and we can't find any record of you having any special leave. <laughs> so I don't quite know what had happened there. But so I ended up leaving uh, August. But actually, my leaving day was was effectively October. And I was so lucky, Paul, because I went straight to the Commonwealth Games with, mm. with the England hockey team. So, so the the and you, you, you know, I've done quite a bit of work um, over the years supporting our service folk who come out, you know, Help for Heroes, Pathfinder scheme, helping people in that transition between an institutionalised job and then suddenly yep. you're self-employed and you've yep. got to cook your own food. And for me, that transition was very very easy because i went straight from sort of policing uh and the last two or three years i was generally in a training role i was also involved in a i had a, a specific role working around aircraft security um supporting that uh, a, a sort of department for transport funded program so i wasn't for my last year or two i wasn't really front line as such um so it was a natural transition october 2010 from the job straight into Commonwealth Games, working with the England hockey team. I mean, it, 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 thank you. It, it couldn't really get much better. Could it? <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And because you've been to a number of Olympics, um, what's that like? As a you know, with the, with the team, and you know, how does that all fall together? Uh, it, it, they are incredible events. Uh, it's. It's funny because when I compare those sorts of events with some of the police events I was involved with, I think one of the things, Lon London 2012 was was unbelievable. Mm. Um, you are a home Olympics. I had to pinch myself on a number of occasions because you would you dream of a, being part of a sports team or I, I had done from, you know, those days when I was sitting in my milk float, um, dreamed of being part of a, as an athlete, as a coach, as a team manager at a home Olympics. And the London was very, very special. And it, it went very, very quickly. The, the, the odd thing about it was that when you're ensconced right in the middle of something, and this is how I, why I compare this with the job, when you're right in the middle of something and you, you, you can't see 
the wood for the trees, really. You don't get the impact of what's actually happening outside this bubble. So for us, we were we, we were within the Olympic Village uh, for for two weeks, two and a half weeks. And it wasn't until you actually walked out into the Olympic Park that you realized the effect that this event was having on London and having on just everybody in the in the UK. It, it, it just and when you stand back afterwards and look back on that, I think it was very, very proud to be part of it. Very proud also to be protected by many of my colleagues who I'd worked with, who I would see around the village wearing strange made up name country track suits, um, carrying, uh, you know, little little sort of leather pouches, yeah. uh, walking around the village thinking, now where's, I, I've not heard of West Sudan. <laughs> You're a member of the West Sudan <laughs> Olympic support team. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, lovely having having all our uh, the support. But I think the, the event, the, the other thing that I hadn't prepared myself for is that when you build up for an event like that, um, I, I've learned now about what we call a pre-mortem. So the what-ifs. If you are successful, what, you know, what's life going to be like afterwards for you? Secondly, if things don't go well, have you planned for that? So, so the pre-mortem. So for us as a, as a, as a team, we were, we were an outside chance for medal. Uh, home, home Olympics, I think we were ranked fourth or fifth in the world at that time. But I hadn't even thought beyond the closing ceremony. And actually what happened that week was we got absolutely smashed in the Olympic semi-final uh, by Holland. We lost 9-2. And it was a very strange event because I think I talk about stats in hockey. I think we entered their shooting circle 23 times. They entered ours 27 times in the game, yet we lost 9-2. And it was a pinch me moment, but for all the wrong reasons. So I think we were uh, five one down at half time, and and I was having to pinch myself. And I, is this a nightmare? Is this actually happening? And it and it was. And it, and I think it had a massive impact on us. And we hadn't planned for that. No. We hadn't pre-mortemed it. Um, and then two or three days later, the Olympics are suddenly over, and I'm at home, and it's this massive. The transition between being in the Olympic environment and then being at home was something I hadn't I hadn't worked out, and I really struggled. I you know I make no it's this transition thing. I really struggled with it. We 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 lost in the semi final. We hadn't won a medal, um, and I I learned again so much from from that event uh, because I think the other the other areas around how our athletes transition from that event. Um, so in answer to your original question, fantastic to be involved with London. That that was probably the high point for me. And I think when I look back at the events of 7-7 and the what happened thereafter in that July 2005, and I think about the despair of that, but then the joy of being involved in something in London. OK, I wasn't in the job then, but being involved in that and seeing you know, the, the Stockwell to Stratford journey, if you like, yeah. through, through the period is quite, quite incredible. Um, so Olympic special. Tokyo, a little bit. Rio, obviously, I didn't go for, for reasons yeah. that we discussed. Tokyo was, was, was very different. Uh, a year late. Difficult, particularly for athletes, because no friends, no family. COVID means nobody in the stadium. Very strange. Uh, Olympic Village training venue, competition venue, Olympic Village. That was all we saw of Japan, which wow. was a shame because it's the first time that I that I'd been there. And again, uh, a for a fifth place finish, lost in the quarterfinals. So, so disappointing. But after 2012 and after some of the other events that I've been involved with through my life, I had learned before that this was always going to be my last event. And I'd I'd pre-mortemed and I'd planned and rehearsed the transition from that environment uh, back back home, 
what I hadn't planned for was the transition between manager of the Great Britain men's hockey team to, oh, I'm not involved anymore. And and that was something that I've I've ch- I've I have I've struggled with a little bit, um, just stepping away from that environment. Well, I'll tell you another quick story. You talked about the '88 World Cup. That was at Luton. Was that the one at Luton? No, '86 uh, World Cup was at Wilsdon, Wilsdon. London. Wilsdon, yeah. Father-in-law was the president of the East at the time. And and here's the here's the other part of the story. There's um. Oh, Martin Foxall. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. My, and my father-in-law, there were a load of kids who were in um, Homerton House School. So Steve Ashton, Chris yeah. Chris Gladman, Mark Donnelly, um, Nicky Thompson. And because these kids were oiks, you know, they don't, they won't mind me saying it, they were oiks and um, Kim, I've forgotten his name, but anyway, and they bought them all hockey sticks. And these kids were either going to get into a load of trouble or they're going to be good sportsmen. And they went on to be... Fantastic sportsmen, they're all, all family friends. The, uh, the odd thing with that, Paul, is that that, they, that actually plays a part in my story. Oh, so right. when I was uh, a riot training instructor down at Greenwich and, and working and living in Tottenham and commuting between the two, um, I was initially I thought, you know, here's this toff from Hertfordshire. This, the, the Essex lads, uh, Nicky Thompson and um, the Homerton House, that Homerton House group of kids used to, you know, the, we are the Toffs from Hertfordshire, from Scotland. <laughs> but, but once they found out that I was a copper, I think initially there was a little bit of fear, but then actually they realised that that I was quite a reasonable bloke. And and I, I I had some really good banter and became very good friends with with particularly Chris Gladman and, and, to- and Nicky Thompson, who I, I've seen recently. And they used to be between Tottenham and Greenwich, on the uh, off the Upper Clapton Road. There was a little bit of astroturf, twenty five meters by twenty five meters, right in the not fenced off or anything, just in the middle of a little sort of open green space. And Martin Foxall used to use that after school. He'd take the kids down there, and on my way back from Greenwich, I would pack my stick in the car. I'd, I'd stop, I'd go and join them, and I'd go and play on the AstroTurf there in uh, in Hompton House. Um, in, not in Hompton House, but in um, Upper Clapton. Yeah. Um, so I, I, over the years, have developed um, a, a brilliant relationship with those guys. And, and I think it, the, the other thing that comes to mind is around, I think, their respect of the police mm. probably lifted as a result of actually knowing a copper who played hockey. Yeah. Um, or or yeah. St- Steve Ashton, who who was a fantastic goalkeeper in his day, and he was a, a little so and so as a kid, but he went on to be the clerk of the chambers for Baroness Scotland. You know, he honestly, and he he still plays. I think he's still playing at Louts. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, it is, and it's six degrees of separation in this, you know, in the hockey world, um, certainly in in this area. Yeah. Tell us about your fundraising. You've 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 raised some monies and you've done some great things with that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Over the years, I uh, I've always I, I don't want to, this to sound naff because it probably does, but I I've always felt that I need to give back to a sport that's given me so much. And you know, hockey, as we know, we talk about the hockey family and we talk about it. Being an amateur sport, although top level, it is very professional and there's you know, a lot of money in it. But I think over the years, it's it's been something that I've derived so much from. And it it began, I suppose, with some work that I did pre-London Olympics. Jason Lee, who was our head coach at the time, we, with a guy called Chris Grant, who did a lot for the London Olympic legacy. Yeah. Um, set up a uh, a project called the free flyers um, and free stands for friendship respect excellence three of the olympic values and we went onto the estates in newham and took a 50 or 60 kids boys and girls gave them this opportunity to play hockey now you know for these folk life was really about um, you know, chicken nuggets for tea, 
PlayStation if they were lucky. It, it, life was it, it was pretty tough, yeah. I, I think, for for a lot of them. So we were supported by Richard Mantell, and uh, who then was working for it was Specialist Sports, who sorted out some kit and. And we started this legacy project. And that's how, I guess, the fundraising, the charity thing began. Um, uh, that was still going uh, in 2015. I think we, 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 so four, five, yeah, six years later, we were, we were still running sessions for these, for these kids. And for some of them that, you know, they're still playing hockey. It, 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 it was quite life changing. So that was the first thing, I think, going onto those estates. Um, and giving them something that, that you know, they, they were living in the Olympic borough, but they weren't really getting anything out of it. So so that's how it, I guess, it began the whole fundraising thing. And then over a hockey writers club dinner after a couple of beers, there was a discussion about the charity as it, as it was then, which was Wellchild, which was the hockey charity. Yeah. Have got a couple of spots in the London Marathon. Um yeah, you know, do you fancy do you fancy doing it? And I suddenly thought, why don't I dribble a hockey ball? Uh, so that's that's how the the idea came. I probably a little bit alcohol induced, but uh, decided that we were gonna we were gonna myself and Jason Lee were gonna dribble the London Marathon, and and we did, and we did it in I think it was uh, five and a half hours, some something like that, which wasn't wow. wasn't bad. We we trained for it. Um, we raised. Nearly, nearly ten grand, I think, for World Child. So that was how it started. Um, extreme hockey dribbling, as I call it. And then I got bitten by the bug a little bit with this. And people were saying, "Wow, well, what are you going to do next? You know, why don't you drill up and down Snowden?" And I thought, "That's crazy. No, why don't why don't we let's have a go at that?" So myself and John Bleeby, who is now um, involved with. Uh, work with the elite development pro- development program with with Great Britain Hockey, we then decided we were going to dribble the three peaks. So we dribbled up and down Ben Nevis, uh, dribbled up and down uh, Scaffold Pike, and then dribbled up and down Snowden in a total time of about just under eighteen hours, I think. Uh, and again, raise, raising money for charity. And I think one of my weird weird memories was being interviewed by five live halfway up scaffold <laughs> party um on uh yeah it was a it, i think it was the afternoon program or, or uh and that you know that's do, do you ever foresee, you know can you can you foresee this that you're going to be halfway up scaffold pipe dribbling hockey ball and you'll be interviewed live on the radio no i can't <laughs> So it's really yeah. Uh, so that was that was a bit a bit sort of wild and wacky. But again, you know, we we raised a lot of money for charity, and it was something different. Um, and I became, you know, known as the the mad extreme hockey dribbler. I then got involved a lot with Hockey for Heroes, supporting that cause, uh, and did a, a sponsored dribble from Cardiff to London. We were carrying. It was a, a thing known as Operation Stretcher. We were carrying a. Uh, paraplegic ex-marine and I was dribbling a hockey ball um, along behind them and then the last one uh, well no I I did the London Marathon again um, last year in a I won't mention that a far far slower time I won't mention the actual time but you know the the body the weight and everything is uh, (laughs) I've got to a point where I thought I've got to do it and and raised a lot of money for Alzheimer's with the link with Imran Shawani, Alzheimer's Research, um, who, of course, was one of the 1988 hockey heroes. Yeah. Uh, so that one. And then sandwiched in between was probably the oddest, the oddest extreme dribble, which was I was part of a Hockey for Heroes team with some folk from Lincoln Minster School. And we set our hearts on getting into the Guinness Book of Records by playing the highest game of hockey which we did up on Annapurna, uh, eight, oh, it's about 18,000 feet, I think. And I dribbled a hockey ball all the way up to that event, again, raising money for charity. So I have I like to think, Paul, I've hung my dribbling stick up and I need to hand this over to somebody much younger, much fitter. Well, Joel Forrester, who's a, a mutual friend, he um, maybe he's the man to take on the job. I, I oh, no, you said, you said fitter. 
yeah. he's got a lower, a lower sort of centre of gravity. He certainly well, but, yes. <laughs> and might suit him. <laughs> so, what are you doing now? Uh, so, I've, I've started for the last probably where are we? Twenty eighteen. Four years or so, I've been working as a consultant, now an associate with a company called Clear Track Performance. We're in learning and development. We are a group of ex police, ex um, ex elite sport, ex special forces, um, and we we go into private and public sector and talk quite a bit about things like you know that incident, the Stockwell incident, and what we what we learned from that, comparing much of what what we did in a high performing environment to to what folk do so uh, by folk i mean highways we've got a contract with some highways organizations so we talk to them about decision making about communication uh, and i've been doing that yeah for about three or four years but i also now locally because i'm living up in suffolk I work at Framlingham College doing some hockey coaching, supporting their athletes, both as a coach, but also mentoring some of the uh, staff and some of the, uh, the sort of sick form and graduates. And uh, so enjoying that because I can commute from home. I was I was getting to a point with the clear track work where it was a little bit of an Alan Partridge lifestyle, you know, three, three nights in a travel tavern and Northampton and you, you sort of think I'm 60 and I probably need to be moving on from that a little bit now so yeah um, and I'm, I'm pretty much enjoying I'm doing about 25 hours a week with Framlingham live on the Suffolk coast two lurchers you know what's it's great what's not so like? a season, season ticket holder at Watford uh, for my sins but I'm, I'm, I'm not able to get down to as many games as I'd like to at the moment because oh, you're in the land of Ed Sheeran up there, aren't you? And his, his other half used to play hockey. Um, yes, and she still does. Does she? For, um, yeah, she um, plays for Halston. Oh, does she? Magpies? Uh, Halston Magpies, yeah. Does yeah. she? Yeah, because I remember yeah. um, my son Josh was at uh, Chelmsford and he said, if I, I said, Dad, Ed Sheeran's here. And he'd gone along to, <laughs> to watch her play. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, I had a funny moment at St Albans. Uh, he was down there watching her play against St Albans women, and I, I, because I'd been at St Albans for so many years, knew everybody at St Albans. So there were loads of familiar faces, and I was walking around the pitch, and there was this familiar face that I looked at and nodded and went, "All right," and he went, "All right." <laughs> it wasn't, an, it wasn't obviously a St Albans face. It was Ed Sheeran who was there watch, watching his then girlfriend Jerry yeah. playing. Um, and I suddenly realised afterwards, do you realise what you've just, yeah, you've just like <laughs> nodded, John Ball, uh, thinking that you knew him from, from hockey, but uh, it's not. <laughs> brilliant. Well, yeah. I've, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Andy, and thank you so much for your time today. But before we conclude this interview, is there anything you'd like to add, alter or correct? Um, I don't think so. I think... Um, I mean, my, 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 I guess my overriding, um, what do I take away from my, my life in the job, the way I, 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 I feel now, I, I think being judged around the immediacy, the immediacy of something, I, I, I would, I would always say to anybody, try and look further ahead than, than the next day the next minute the next hour because because ultimately um when i reflect on some of the things that were absolutely life-changing at the time when you reflect in, in in a year's time how much impact would it would it have had on your life how important is it to react so the example for me is around not going to the Olympic Games in 2016, where at the time I, I was absolutely I was spitting feathers that I, I couldn't go. But actually, look at the bigger picture. I still want to go to Tokyo. If I react in a certain way now, that's going to have an impact on 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 what happens later on. So that that would be my my big, if you like, 
reflection is is try and always see the bigger picture in everything that you do. Wise words, sir. Andy, thank you so much for today and I wish you well and I look forward to catching up with you for a beer at some point. Thanks. Cheers, Paul.